What's going on, all my people out there in the YouTube land, all my brothers and sisters, man? What's good? What's good? Hope all y'all are having a good day, man. I want to get on to the topic of the Godhead, aka the Trinity, right? A lot of people, I know uh, a lot of y'all are still fighting uh, about it. Um, I posted a video, I think yesterday, on Damon Richardson, <clears throat> just doing a little, no, two, I think like two days ago. Just did a little, I think, 10 minute video, uh, I think 10, 5 minute video on the Trinity. It wasn't the whole thing because it's a, it's a pretty long video, but just to give y'all an idea of what he was talking about. And um, there was a, a person who was being honest about it. And that's, I appreciate the fact that he said, you know, uh, I don't completely understand. I'm, I'm confused. You get what I'm saying? He was like, I, I'd rather God just come down to me and just explain it to me, right? And uh, I like the fact that he was honest, you know, because me, myself, for a, a long time, I struggled understanding the Trinity because the concept is so hard to to, to really grasp, you know. <clears throat> but uh, in time, I was able to understand it. Right. So when it comes down to the Trinity or the Godhead, because Godhead and Trinity, you can use either one because they both mean the same. If you believe in the Godhead in the Bible, ultimately you believe in the Trinity. It's just the fact that people have a hard time understanding what exactly means or getting a, a strong grasp for it. Right. So um, I can't remember the exact scripture, but it basically says how, you know, we know that we're not going to fully understand God in his fullness and everything of who he is. Right. But what we uh, what we do understand, what we know pertain to scripture is that whatever that god allowed to be written in scripture whatever god allowed to be revealed in his word <clears throat> then that's what god wants us to know or wants us to learn right so everything isn't in the bible everything isn't in the bible everything is revealed in the bible but everything that is revealed in the bible you can bet your bottom dollar that god has allowed that to be in there so that we can get to know him so when it comes down to the trinity people don't like the word trinity because it's not in the bible well guess what godhead is and because god allowed that word godhead to be in scripture then he wants us to know what is this godhead right or it's my daughter uh what is the trinity what is this thing about okay so let's let's get straight to it man all right so when people talk about the godhead they often use the term trinity in reference to the father son and the holy spirit the term trinity is not in the bible however that does not necessarily mean that the concept is unbiblical, right? It's a lot of words that are in that, that excuse me, there are a lot of words that aren't in the Bible, but you can bet you that they are scriptural. Rapture, which is another topic that people don't, but whatever the case may be, uh, those who believe in a rapture. Uh, rapture isn't, you know, in the Bible, but we know that it is, it is biblical. You get what I'm saying? It's a lot of words that aren't in the Bible, but they're biblical, right? That's the whole point. Um, yet many believe that there is just one person of God and deny the concept of the Trinity, right? So, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to look at what the Bible teaches about the Godhead, what it means, and whether there are three persons of God or just one. And I got some notes down, and then I got some scripture along with uh, on my, my laptop screen, right? So, the meaning of the Godhead, right, is often used in the terms with the Trinity. Uh oh, hold on, y'all. Right. So the meaning of Godhead. Right. You can find these scriptures in Acts. Uh, you can find the speaking of the Godhead in Acts 17 and 29. Right. Where it says for as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, silver or stone graven, uh, graven by art and man's device, which is, again, Acts 17 and 9. That's in the King James Version. Right. Boom. Um, we also have Romans uh, 1 and 20 for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Romans 1 and 20 KJV, right? Depends on what you read based on the translation. Uh, I don't really KJV here and there really a CSB type of guy. Um, and then we also have. For in, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, Colossians 2 and 9, right? Other translations use different terms in place of Godhead, like divine nature and deity. So uh, whether you use divine, based on the translation, they'll use divine nature or they use deity. But either way, it's still talking about the Godhead, right? 
uh, these are helpful in understanding the meaning of the term. So this is why you have these uh, different terms. The terms all mean the same, but they're designed to help us uh, understand the meaning of the term of Godhead, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, right. So it says Godhead is about uh, nature, God's nature or possessing the characteristics of God. So when we look at the Godhead again, possessing the characteristics of God and the nature of God, the nature of who God is. Right. Uh, those in the Godhead are part of the Godhood, possessing the characteristics of God. Right. Those in the Godhead. Right. If you believe in a Trinity or if you're struggling, those who are part of the Godhead are part of the Godhood. Right. You can't be part of the God. You can't be in the Godhood if you're not part of the Godhead. You feel me? So um, where is that? Do, 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 do. Those in the Godhead are part of the Godhood, possessing the characteristics of God. So those who are in the Godhead <coughs> possess the characteristics of God. Right. You have to be part of the You can't be in the uh, Godhood unless you're in the Godhead, because if you're in the Godhead, then it says that you possess the characteristics of God. Father, Son and Holy Spirit. They possess the characters of God, not multiple gods, but one God. Right. But let me keep reading because I don't want to confuse y'all. Right. Similar to manhood or brotherhood possessing the same characters as man. Right. So we have uh, manhood. Right. The brotherhood, right? So, uh, like football or basketball, there's a manhood. There's a there's a brotherhood. There's a bond within that basketball team because we all share the same the same characteristics as man, as mankind, as humankind. We share that characteristics. So there's a brotherhood. There's a manhood, right? In the same way, Father, Son, Holy Spirit possess the same characteristics, eternal, co-equal, right? All those things. They possess the same characteristics, right? And uh, it also said um, <coughs> in nature. So they share in nature, right, as in deity, and they share in the characteristics, right? Y'all stand with me. Um, it says uh, now, like I said, I want to be too long with this. It says the characteristics of God, right? So now we're going to the characteristics of who God is. So here are the characteristics of God. God's eternality. Okay. God has no beginning, no end. Right. It says before the mountains were born or uh, you gave birth to the earth in the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Psalm 90 and 2. So let's talk about the eternality. God has no beginning and God has no ending. Right. <clears throat> Uh, immut immutability, right? To be immutable means that God is unchanging. This says, for I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed, right? Malachi 3 and 6. Let's keep going. Omnipotence. This means that God is all powerful. When God appears to Abraham, uh, Abram, he said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me <clears throat> and be blameless. Genesis 17 and 1. The word Almighty means most powerful, right? Omniscience. This refers to the fact that God is all knowing. Uh, David described this in detail. Oh Lord, you have uh, searched me and know me. You know what uh, when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways, right? Uh, even before there is a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all. This is Psalm 139, 1 through 4. God knows everything about us, no matter where we are or what we do. All right. Next one. Omnipresence. Dave, uh, David wrote this. Where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, <clears throat> behold, you are there. This is in Psalm 139, 7 through 8. <clears throat> when we refer to God as being omnipresent, which is present everywhere, right? We use the term in an accommodative sense. God is in heaven, right? So God is in heaven in Ecclesiastes 5 and 2. 
in Matthew 6 and 9. Unless he comes out on the earth, which is in Genesis 11 and 5. This is where, if I'm correct, God came down to uh, to the Tower of Babel to see what, even though God knew what was going on, but he came down to see what was going on, confounded the languages, right? So, <clears throat> but this is related to the previous point. God, his omniscience, which means God knows all, his omniscience makes it as if he were present everywhere, even though he resides in heaven, right? So even though God resides in heaven, that's where God, that's where God is. His omni, uh, his omniscience makes it seem like he's everywhere, which he is, but like, you get what I'm saying? He, he, he resides in heaven, but it's like he's everywhere, knows everything, though he sits in heaven, Right? So it says any entity entity that possesses the characteristics described above can accurately be recognized as part of the Godhead or Godhood since they share the characteristics of God. Now, let's take a quick pause. <clears throat> we have to ask ourselves, does Jesus Christ, <clears throat> the Messiah, right before Christ even came in the flesh, he was God, right? In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God and the word became flesh. We also understand that the father, right? The father who is also God. And we also know that the Holy Spirit is also uh, the comforter. You get what I'm saying? If you go back to that video that I posted, that I posted about the Trinity, you'll see like a little cartoon version of the Trinity. Go look at that video and listen to Damon Richardson breaks it down in scripture when Jesus says us. He says us. It's not me. It's not singular. But when Christ talks, he says us. Like when he says, let us make man in our image. It's not talking about the angels he's saying us. He also says uh, talking about being the recipient of love before anything came into this world, before the world was even created, before anything was even made. Christ said, you have you have loved me. Right. You have loved me. What is love if there is no recipient? Right. What? how does the father love? How? You know what I'm saying? How is there love without someone receiving it? So before anything was made, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit were all together and they shared that love together. You get what I'm saying? <coughs> you can all you can check all this through scripture, man. It's all in there. Right? So <coughs> um then it also then went down to this one, right? It says there is one God, right? So a lot of people struggle with this. Well, uh, when we come into the Trinity, we serve one God. We don't serve multiple gods. And that's the thing. We're not saying that uh, we serve multiple gods. We understand that the word is one God. Right. But uh, let's 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 get into it. OK. Uh, monotheism, the belief in one deity was unique to God's people in the Old Testament. Right. Moses said, hero Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Which is in Deuteronomy six and four. The Lord said, remember the former things uh, long past for I am God and there was no other God. I am God and there was no one like me. And people use that scripture to say, see, there is no Trinity because God said I am one and there is no one like me. There is no other God. And people think that we're saying we, we worship three different gods. It's not the case. Right. Um, the idea was clearly expressed that there was only one God. He commands the people. You shall have no other gods before me. Exodus 2, 20 and, 30, 20 and 3. This would have been different from the surrounding nations who serve many gods. So God said, I am one. I'm the one true God. There is no God like me because look who God was talking to. Talking to the Israelites because these uh, Gentile nations were worshiping uh, multiple different gods. But God was like, no, I'm the one true God. There's no God like me. All these other gods that these Gentile nations serve are false gods worshiping me. I am the one true God and there was no God like me. That's why he said that. But people use this verse to combat or to shut down the doctrine of the Trinity. OK, in the first century, the Gentile nations also served many gods. Like I just said, when Paul was in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols, which is in Acts 17 and 16. In writing to the brethren in Corinth, Paul said, uh, there were so-called gods, many gods and many lords, right? First Corinthians eight and five. However, the New Testament plainly teaches that there is one God. So we, as me believing in Trinity, as me believing in the, as the believing in the eternal Godhead, I believe that there is one God. 
right? I never said I, I worship three different gods. Anyone who understands or truly <laughs> gets and grasps the concept of the Trinity, we know that there is one God. You get what I'm saying? So, um, the, 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 uh, Paul described the idols as so-called gods because there is no such thing as an idol in the world. And there is no God but one. First Corinthians 8 verses 4 through 5. Okay? He added, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things and we exist for him. First Corinthians 8 and 6. He told the Ephesians that there is one God and Father of all who is over of, who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4 and 6. So that right there for that part, because then when I'm about to get into the Trinity, there are three persons of God. What about we we uh just shut down that whole notion that oh you who believe y'all who believe in the Trinity, y'all believe in uh y'all believe in uh multiple gods, right? Y'all worship multiple gods. No, no, we don't. We believe that there is one God. And even in the New Testament, Paul even says Paul believes that there is one God. But guess what? Even Paul preached the Trinity. Paul believed on the eternal Godhead. And he understood that there is one God. You get what I'm saying? But here you go. Hmm. But you gotta, you can't just read these scriptures at face value. Like, do, 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 do. See, this is what it says exactly. And then run with it. No, you got to get into the context. You got to understand exactly what the scriptures are saying or else you're misinterpreting the scriptures. And now you're going against the Trinity. You're going against the eternal Godhead. You, this is a essential, right? This is essential for the faith. Like Damon Richardson said, if you get the Godhead, right? If you get the Trinity wrong, you get God wrong. And if you get God wrong, then ultimately get salvation wrong. You feel me? And if you get salvation wrong, you're preaching a false gospel, which is going to uh, result in um, uh, false converts. You feel me? <coughs> so we have to, uh, if, if you don't understand the Trinity, that's cool. I'm okay with that. Right. It's not easy to grasp, but don't just completely shut it down without really seeking understanding and trying to understand uh, how does this make sense. Right. So let's get into there are three persons of God, not three different gods, not three different gods, but uh, there are three persons, three persons of God. Right. So while the scriptures are clear that there is one God, they also describe three persons of God, the father, the son and the Holy Spirit are each referred as uh, referred to as God in the New Testament. Don't believe me? Let's check it out, right? The Father is God, right? Feel me. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, <coughs> such an utterance as this was made to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Second Peter <coughs> 2, uh, 2, 1, and 17, excuse me, y'all. <clears throat> the son Jesus is God. But the but of the son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. And the righteous scepter is a scepter of his kingdom. Hebrews 1 and 8. That's the son. The Holy Spirit is God, right? But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of land? You have not lied to men, but to God referencing the Holy Spirit. You have lied to the Holy Spirit. You have lied to God. So all these, these scriptures that I read pertaining to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Father is God. The Son, Christ the Messiah, is God. The Holy Spirit is God. They're not three different gods. One God, three persons. But guess what? They share the same in characteristics. They share the same in nature. And that's the difference. That's the difference. They're not different gods. We serve one God, but God's in three different persons. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, again, they share in the same characteristics. They all share the same characteristics. How do we know this? Because they were there in the beginning in Genesis, and they share the same nature. In the beginning, God, right? In the beginning, God. And God spoke, right? Let there be light. God spoke that word. Stop that. God spoke the word, right? And the word took action. And we see creation. And then we also see that the the uh the spirit of God hovered over the waters. So in the very beginning, before anything was created, before anything was made, we see the eternal Godhead in the very beginning. We also know that the eternal Godhead, uh, they all play a part in our salvation, right? So let us keep going. <coughs> 
um, the, 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 though <coughs> we do not find the term Trinity being used in the Bible, we can see from the passages above that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are all God. This means that a that as members of the Godhead, they share the characteristics of God that we noticed earlier, right? And then there are several Old Testament passages that teach the concept of the Trinity. So you've got Old Testament passages that teach the concept of uh, the Trinity, right? Um, matter of fact, I'm going to read it for y'all, man. I'm going to read it for y'all. <coughs> In the creation, right? So let's get to creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the uh, surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. Genesis 1, 1 and 2. This passage mentions that God and the Spirit, right? In a parallel passage, John describes the word Jesus, which is in John 1 and 14, also being present and instrumental in creation. Come on, man. John 1, 1 and 3. So the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit all present in the very beginning of creation. They're eternal. So they were there before anything else, anything was even formed. They were there, right? Let's get to creating man. Boy, y'all got me hyped, bro. I'm telling you. I'm passionate about this thing, bro. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Genesis 1, 26 through 27. <clears throat> us, that word us, like Damon Richardson was saying, us, does not include angels as some have supposed. We know this because man was made in the image of God, not in the image of angels. Therefore, we cannot conclude from this passage that God includes more than one person right let's keep it going after the fall of adam and eve the lord uh the lord god said behold the man has become like one of us knowing good and evil genesis 3 and 22 again the plural pronoun us the plural pronoun y'all the plural pronoun us is used for god god is saying us who is god talking to who's god talking to when he says us this is plural Right. So he must be talking to the spirit and talking to the son before the son was in the flesh. Right. Because now we still talking about we talking about Old Testament <clears throat> and scouting the people of Babel. Ooh, um, yeah. <laughs> right. So in scouting the people of Babel, the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, behold, they are one of one people and they have all they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us come. Let us go down there, confuse the language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth. And they stopped building the city. This was in Genesis 11, five through eight. Right. This is another instance of which the Lord is referencing using the plural pronoun us. See, do y'all see it? Y'all keep seeing us, 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 right? Isaiah's commission. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Right? Uh oh, who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. Isaiah 6 and 8. This passage makes the same point as the previous one. God is constantly, God is speaking. He's saying us, plural, us. You cannot sit here and deny. Now, if you don't understand, like I said, if you don't understand, that's cool. But you can't just completely just deny the fact that the Trinity is unbiblical. That is that that is not in the Bible when God is constantly using a plural us. Us, 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 right? <clears throat> the prophecy of Christ's reign. The Lord says to my Lord, set up my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Psalm 110 and 1. The Hebrew writer quoted this passage and emphasized the fact that the Lord was not referring to angels. Right. Hebrews 1 and 13. Instead, this was about the father and the son. Hebrews 1 and 5. Right. Um, who? I'm almost done, y'all. I'm almost done. For those who are still watching it, I appreciate it, right? But let me keep going. Though the concept of the Trinity cannot can be seen in the Old Testament, there were not many details given. However, the New Testament reveals this concept more completely, providing us with additional information 
about the three distinct persons of God. Right. So now we went from the Old Testament speaking of the Trinity. Now um, they're giving us an uh, idea. Not to say an idea, but it does support the Trinity. But here we can see, uh, I guess you can say uh, we're given a lot more details about the Trinity than pertaining to the Old Testament. Right. So at the baptism of Jesus, right after being baptized, Jesus came in immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and lightning on him and behold a voice of the heaven said this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased which is in matthew 3 16 through 17 right the voice from heaven was that of the father distinct from him was jesus who was being baptized and the holy spirit who was ascending as a dove trinity let's keep going and the great commission right Go, therefore, and making disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Matthew 20 and 19, right? Jesus indicated that those who would be his disciples were to be baptized in the name of three persons. For those who like to argue, hey, uh, Jesus' name only, Jesus' name only, Great Commission. What is greater than a Great Commission? Baptism is important. Don't get, don't get, don't get it twisted. Baptism is important. If, if somebody gets born again, I highly advise them to, to, to get baptized. But when we talk about the Great Commission, this is the Great Commission. This is what great Christ commanded, right? Uh, go there and make disciples of, of all nations, baptize them in the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus indicated that all those who would be his disciples were to be baptized in the name of all three. The Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Trinity. Let's keep going. Sending the helper to the apostles. When the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father... That is the spirit of truth who proceeds from the father. He will testify about me. John 15 and 26. As Jesus gave this promise to his apostles, right? He clearly articulated the fact that the father, the spirit and himself were three distinct persons, right? So I'm going to read it again for y'all. When the helper, the Holy Spirit comes. Whom I, Christ to speak, whom I was sent to you, I, Christ, sent to you from the Father. Three, that the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father will testify about me. So this again, y'all, the spirit, the spirit, that the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father will testify about me, Jesus. Three, again. Let's keep going. The closing of Paul's second letter to Corinth, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Again, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Second Corinthians 13 of 14. In closing his epistle, Paul highlighted certain blessings we have from God. In doing so, he emphasized each person of the Godhead. <clears throat> all right. Part of our platform for unity, right? There is one body and one spirit, just as just as also you were called in hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and one father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Ephesians 4, 4 through 6. And describing all of the ones that form the basis of our unity as Christians it is significant that Paul described all three persons of deity, not different gods, right? But all three persons of deity because they share the same nature in deity and they share the same characteristics, right? They're not separate gods. Uh, their work in the scheme of redemption. Now let's get to it. How does the Trinity come together in the work of our redemption, right? According to the foreknowledge of God, the Father, by, sanctifying, by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ, be sprinkled with his blood. May grace and peace be with you or uh, be yours in the fullest measure. First Peter one and two. Peter explained that all three persons of the Godhead each had their own role in our salvation, which is what I said earlier in the video. Right. Let's keep going. Jude's, uh, Jude's uh, admonition. <clears throat> but you, beloved, building yourself up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit keeping yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Jude 20 and 21. 
like Paul in his second letter to Corinth, Jude cl uh, closed his letter by mentioning certain benefits we derive from each person of God, right? <clears throat> the opening of the book of Revelation. And then after that, we're dang near done, right? So opening the book of Revelation, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, which is in Revelation 1, 4 through 5, right? John described one who was eternal. The spirit described symbolically since Revelation was filled with symbolic language as the seven spirits and Jesus Christ, the one who is who was and is to come referred to God the Father. This is not to say that Jesus and the Holy Spirit were not eternal, but this trait was emphasized for the Father in this message. So then we see the Trinity also mentioned in the book of Revelation. Again, Revelation 1, 4 through 5. Check that out for yourself, right? And then we're getting and then we're just about at the conclusion, y'all, because I'm at 30 minutes. Some people claim that Jesus is the only person of God. Yet he plainly stated that he was distinct from the father in defending the claims he was making about. Oh, sorry, that's my daughter. In defending the claims he was making about himself, Jesus said, even in your law, it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself and the father who sent me testifies about me. John 8, 17 through 18. If Jesus and the father were the same person, his argument would have been absurd. He told the disciples, I am the vine and my father is the vine dresser. John 15 and 1. Referring to the final day of judgment, Jesus said, but of that day and of the hour, no one knows. Not even the angels of heaven know the son, but the father alone. And People are, oh, well, how could Jesus know and not know? I suggest you study up on the hypostatic union of Jesus Christ, being fully God and also being fully man, right? But that's in Matthew 24 and 36. If the father alone knows when the day will be and the son does not know, then there cannot be only one person of God, right? Jesus also made it clear that he was distinct from the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, whoever speaks a word against the son of man it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, let me read that again. Christ said, whoever speaks, a, whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, you didn't say Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Jesus is not the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is not Jesus, right? That's, that's basically what it's saying. Whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come, which is in Matthew 12 and 32. The consequences for speaking against Jesus and the Holy Spirit were different, clearly indicating that Jesus and the Holy Spirit were two different persons, two different persons, but still shared the same characteristics, two different persons, but still shared in nature and divinity. Right. Here's our conclusion. The scripture teach the scriptures teach that there is one God, which we believe. So the scripture teaches that there is one God and three distinct persons of God, the father the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They have worked together in order to make our salvation possible, which is in 1 Peter 1 and 2, right? Therefore, it is important that we understand and appreciate the roles that each one fulfilled in making eternal life available to us. Whew. So, <clears throat> I know that was <clears throat> long, y'all, but I feel like it was needed because this is a salvation issue. This is, uh, this is up there. This isn't, Secondhand doctrine. This is closed handed doctrine, and this is something that uh, needs to be taken serious. The Bible tells us that we need to be uh, defenders of the gospel. And when you talk about the, uh, the eternal Godhead, when you talk about the Trinity, the Trinity is interwoven. It's woven in with the gospel. And if you if you get the Trinity wrong, then ultimately you're going to get the gospel wrong as well. Because you got to understand that all three play a part. They all play a role in that salvation right so man uh, i hope that is blessed y'all again um excuse me for being fired up i get passionate about this stuff man because this is people's 
souls, man. Souls online salvation, man. Like this, this is serious. Um, so uh, I'm not angry or upset, but this is me. This is me getting passionate. Anytime you're passionate about something, you're going to raise your voice. You're going to get excited, right? Because I want people to understand this. And I know in due time, if you want the truth pertaining to the Trinity, pertaining to the eternal Godhead, God is going to reveal truth. Anybody who has the spirit of God within them, the spirit is going to reveal truth to you pertaining to this matter, right? And give you truth. So, um, I hope that'll bless y'all, man. And I hope that y'all take this to the Lord. Really study, man. Do a lot of studying. We, we got laptops now. We got computers. We got cell phones. We got all these things, man. Use these resources uh, to to your utilage, man. Use it. Use all the everything, man. Type type whatever you can. Write down notes. Jot down everything you can. Look at <clears throat> look up. Uh, study the early church and what they believed in and what they practiced and what was the doctrines that they held close and near and dear to their hearts. All these things matter because they're connected to scripture. But if we're just reading the Bible at face value and we're not doing any research, we're not looking up context, we're not looking up church history, we're not doing any of those things, but we're just believing off of what people say because they have a large following, because they have views and, and because they're charismatic, that's not going to get you nothing. You get what I'm saying? And I'm not saying listen to me like I know everything. You know what I'm saying? But what I've learned, like I always I, I, I always say it like in my other video, what I learned, what I've taken in, right, through rightful doctrinal teachings, I want to share with y'all because y'all may not know. Just like I didn't know how y'all didn't know. You feel me? So I hope that just bless y'all again. And I hope that just brought clarity and understanding. Uh, I love y'all, man. And uh, God bless.